as usual, another great guest, but a quick diversion. You'll notice that our full name is the Marketplace for Health, Wealth, and Freedom. Well, let's talk about your health for a moment. If you'd like to escape from the stranglehold of insurance and be able to see alternative doctors or go across state lines for care, then you definitely need to take a look at patientempowerment.mpb.health and see if that's the fix you've been looking for. Now, let's get back to the show. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Health Biz and Politics. We have a great uh, guest today. And I'm just going to jump right into it because Charles is out on vacation. We have Jeff Cantor actually filling in, though it looks like he's got Charles' face in the uh, in the Zoom picture there. But it's great to have you back, Jeff. Jeff has been out for a while with some health issues, and it sounds like he's he's doing well, recovering. And uh, glad to have you on the call with us today. No problem. Glad to. I wanted to keep Charles' photo up. I didn't want to break the continuity of what you guys have been doing. So. Good. Um, so today we have with us a, an entrepreneur, Nicholas Tarazi. He is founder of My911. And I'm thankful to Nicholas because every time, you know, you call the doctor's office, the first thing you hear is, uh, if it's an emergency, hang up and dial 911. And I think he's kind of solved this problem for us. And he'll, he will tell you about it in, in a few minutes. Um, Basically, one thing we talked about early on, and it's perfect with COVID, uh, I mean, the timing, because telemedicine was starting to uh, pick up in uh, around the country and in popularity, but still in single digits. I mean, back in 2019, uh, 2020, when this all happened. And of course, as we know, Zooms, telemedicine, everything has really, uh, it's, it changed everything. So. Now, I think it is, let me look at my notes, something like uh, a third of all primary care calls or visits are done via telemedicine. Uh, and he, Nicholas, you can correct me if I got that wrong. But um, one thing that uh, Mr. Tarazi found was there's a, a problem with continu continuity. So if you do call, you have a problem after hours, your doctor goes home, then what? Then you have to do the 911 thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have some continuity where you call your doctor's office and if it is an emergency, they can still take care of you pretty much. So that's really what uh, uh, Mr. Tarazi saw an op uh, Nicholas, he saw an opportunity, he went for it and he's been very successful. He will tell you more about that. Uh, he's got a great team website you can look at, but before I go any further, let me just turn it over to you, Nicholas, and you can I'll stop the screen sharing. Oh, no problem. Just if you uh, want to bring up if you want to bring up my911.com and then go to about us, you can show some of the team uh, members there um, if that would be helpful. But first and foremost, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here today, Jim. And uh, sorry, Charles couldn't make it. And uh, the other young man, what was his name again? I apologize. Sure. Uh, uh, thank no, that's it. Tuss. Oh, so. So thank you for, for taking me uh, into this uh, time span here. What I want to talk about is uh, traditional telemedicine is defined uh, as a callback or an appointment setting. That's what traditional telemedicine does. And it's mandatory that all health plans have traditional telemedicine. And you've got a Microsoft Word file up. Um, yeah, I don't that's, know if that's what you Okay, no, so, traditional, it so traditional telemedicine is designed as a non-emergent piece so people have access who don't go to urgent care emergency room after hours. The truth is, is that less than 3% of people use traditional telemedicine that's found in your health plan. Doctors will use telemedicine in their offices nine to five, but really what it's turned out to be is that the doctor has put in a drive through window. Um, the doctor's office, the doctor's staff still has to man that, uh, that room. They still have to man the doctor coming to that room. They still have to keep the practice going. And a lot of the doctor's offices are not technically savvy, nor do they have any uh, continuity of care with remote patient monitoring. So quick step back on myself. Uh, not only am I a father of five, been married for over 20 years, but I have um, a background in telecommunications. So in the 1990s, I was building fiber optic internet facilities when most of you were learning what dial-up was. And so I was the backbone to hospitals and school districts and uh, universities here in California. And we were very fortunate that sold all that 
and I went full time into a nonprofit for five years, and I got basically a master's equivalent in leadership development. Uh, it's a non-accredited nonprofit, so but they did have a full training program. And I've lived in Fiji, Philippines, China, UK, and other countries, and I've seen these different health systems, and I've seen how they work. And um, uh, we we still have the best health systems in the world. Um, there's no greater place in the world if, if by chance you have a very severe situation, unexpected or expected, to end up in an emergency room in the U.S. Um, with that said, we have a problem, and the, the continuity of care and the problem set is that 93% of all ambulance rides are non-emergent. Less than 3% of all ambulance rides, 1.3% to be accurate, are life-threatening. So ambulance drivers are out there blue, white-knuckled. Is this the one? Is this the one? Am I going to get there? You know, is this going to be the one I saved today or saved this week or saved once this month? Because again, do the math. 93% of all ambulance rides that you see going down in your neighborhood are non-emergent. Unless you live in certain senior areas, then unfortunately the term is you know, seizure village. And the ambulances are more cune mathematically to more severe situations or life, end of life situations. Um, and, and it wasn't really a joke, but it is what the seniors themselves call that, those villages that they live in. Um, so in the process of working with some ER docs in 2012, I recognized they were taking every call possible. There, there was no reason for them not to take a call. Even if the person was already on their way to, to the emergency room, they would still talk to that person. And I thought that was amazing. That, that broke all barriers in my mind as an entrepreneur of, of setting up business structures. However, one thing I learned quickly with that particular group and a couple of other groups I've worked with is doctors don't know business. Doctors know the biological makeup of you as a human being. A doctor can save your life by telling you what to do next, but a doctor can't tell you how to drive to the office. A doctor can't tell you how to set an appointment up in the computer systems. It's not their forte and there's no dog on them. We should not be dogging these people who spend years and years and years in study to figure out what's wrong with you, minor or severe, in your medical makeup. What we should be doing is giving them a platform that makes it easy for them, that makes it simple for them, and it increases the revenue. That's the beginning of my 911. Why would a doctor give my 911 their access to their medical records, to their population. Number one, we have the safety net of ambulance and medical dispatch. So if your situation is not severe, we still could say, hey, do you have transportation to come into the radiology appointment in four hours? And you might say, no. We might look up your insurance carrier and see that you have medical transportation available to you and we can get that medical transportation dispatched to you because we're part of that medical office. In the case of a more severe situation, at least we know what that severe situation is. And you may deem, I just want to go to the emergency room. I'm uncomfortable. That's my most comfortable place. Boom. There's, a, there's your, your bright, shiny, moving bus down the road with its loud sirens. So again, 93% of all ambulance rides are not emerging. What happens if we were to manage that population? So instead of telling a population to call a separate number, we convert the brick and mortar doctor's office phone number to be open 24 seven. So you have to ask yourself a simple psychological question. If you knew your doctor's office was open 24 seven, would you have ever thought about going to emergency room or urgent care? Probably not. So when would you think about going to urgent care emergency room? When the level of pain or the dysfunction was so great on yourself or someone else in the family, you wouldn't think about calling the doctor's office. And that's the difference between 93% and that 100% realm of statistics I gave you. That's the people we want to go to urgent care emergency room. We want them to feel safe and secure. I don't want anyone on this phone to be stressed and in a situation to where they're like, oh, I'm just, I'm out of it. I can't do it. You know, we want people to be safe and secure. Now, the reality is when an, when an ambulance shows up to someone's home, and even if it's not for them, their heart rate goes up 10 to 20 beats per minute. There's a stress related to ambulance rides. There's a stress related to going to hospitals, hospitals, baby births, marriages, divorces, uh, uh, moving. Those are high stresses in our culture. Well, why does it happen to, once you feel pain or some anomaly in your body or something that you're not comfortable with, why should it be that you have to wait to talk to a doctor? Why should it be that you have to wait to talk to a triage team? You should be able to get that question answered. And since we're connected to the brick and mortar doctor's office, we're connected to your medical records. Since we're connected to your medical records, we probably have access to your existing insurance platform. If by chance you're in the senior market, then we have access to Medicare and we already have you registered in our system. That's where technologies of chronic care management and remote patient monitoring come in because it's really the senior market who drives this business 
not the prop general population of the doctor's office. So when we go to a doctor and we say, look, we're going to unlock your business to be open 24 seven, it's going to cost you nothing, zero, not a penny out of your pocket. We're giving you a 24 hour triage team. We're getting access to all the medical records. We're updating everything. If you've got a list of 10 patients that are high priority to you, then we'll make sure those 10 patients are known to you. We'll, we'll let you know everything that's going on with those 10 patients 24 seven doc. You go, you go take your nap, you go take your rest. Okay. But right now in the meantime, we're handling the calls. Here's our certifications of who's handling the calls. They all come from the emergency room or they come from the ambulance space. So when we connect ourselves to a brick and mortar doctor's office, we literally put a key in a lock that nobody else has seen in the marketplace. It unlocks virtually, not virtually, excuse me, wrong word. It unlocks numerous CPT codes that that doctor's office themselves, even if they're connected to a hospital, could not afford to go 24 seven. Doctors can't afford to go 24 seven. They can't afford to have a staff online 24 seven, but we can afford as a company to have 60 doctor's offices across an entire state. And we can help all those 60 doctor's offices perform better, be in more sync with their population better. And as we work with the senior market, it unlocks chronic care management, remote patient monitoring, pharmacy, and labs. If you have a senior in your life and you send a senior to a doctor and the doctor says, here's this third party chronic care, remote patient monitoring group who you're now going to be attached to, that doctor just number one, lost revenue. Number two, that doctor's still in control of that account through primary care relationship with that account, the doctor may get some re fiduciary responsibility for sending the patient to chronic care remote patient monitoring, but it's a complete black hole when it comes to pharmacy and labs because he's now submitted that patient to a third party system. With our platform, it's all in continuity of care. So there's a thing in the marketplace called medical therapy management. You've got a senior who's got five different doctors and 12 different medications or vice versa, doesn't matter numbers. So a pharmacist has gone to school to review formularies, to look at formularies. Pharmacists did not go to school to dispense 25 pills for a, for a one week run, right? Five, five a pill for five days. So pharmacists want to analyze what's going on with the patient and what's going on with their pill management. That's what a pharmacist went to school for. So we engage pharmacists for medical therapy management. Once we unlock that relationship with the doctor, we start working with that senior market, we can start helping people live a better life. Now for the senior, one phone number, your local doctor's office. For the general population, as we get through their insurance platform and uplift that, one phone number for all your medical situations. How difficult of a training module is it to say, hey, your doctor's office is open 24 seven. That's my intro. I hope I did that in a few minutes. I hope that's comfortable for everybody. And if you have any questions without diving in too much deeper, throw them at me. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, it wasn't gonna, do you want me to look, do you wanna look at the website? We could just, uh, you can direct me through, is there anything there? Uh, um, there's some remote patient monitoring stuff that's on the website. Um, earlier, you mentioned about uh, if you don't, if you hang up and don't, you know, if you call the service and you hang up, you can, you know, hang up and dial 911 if you think this is an emergency. The problem with that sentence structure is if you, it's not if you, if you're in pain and you're in dysfunction or a family member's in pain and dysfunction, who's making the determining factor? A completely non-clinical person. Why, why would you want a non-clinical person making the determining factor? That's why, we're, that's why the public 911 system is skewed. That's why the public 911 system is not uh, processing things accurately. And often when you call the public 911 system, you have to state your emergency. And by stating your emergency, you often find that you are in a queue. And that's not a comfortable place either because you're not talking to a clinical person. So these are some problems that we solve in our culture. I can't fix the public 911 system, but I can help the doctors expand their business. So maybe you could, uh, before we move on to que or public questions, uh, walk us through what happens when somebody calls? Good like, question. Yeah. Ring, 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 ring. Medical services, how can we serve you? We don't propagate the doctor's name. We don't propagate my 911. We ask how we can serve that person. Now, immediately that person starts telling us what's going on. You know, my son rolled their ankle. It's really bad. It's already black and blue. It's been 20 minutes. It's really swelling really bad. I'm scared that it's that, you know, they need x-ray. Well, guess what? The truth of the matter in a scenario like that is they need x-ray. They're, even if they run to urgent care emergency room, they're not going to get to an x-ray unless that bone is popping out. So we have a platform um, that's 
called WebRTC. We immediately can send, if they don't have our app, they're not registered in the system, we can immediately send them a text message to any mobile device anywhere in the world via text or email. They click on the link, just like you clicked on the Zoom link today, but there's no software. There's just permission of a, of a microphone and, a, and the camera. And immediately we can go to video and we can see that ankle injury. Oh. And we can say, hey, I know you're a concerned mom. I get it. I understand. You know, we're concerned parents as well. What we need to do right now is ice that ankle. What we need to do right now is see where we're at in 20 minutes of icing that ankle, see what the range of motion is, what the touch is, and so forth. So can you go ice that ankle and then give us a call back? Now we just brought the severity of the emotional response down because we've now got a uh, confident communications between a clinical person and a parent. Now, more severe situations, I'm loss of breath, I'm dizzy, I'm vomiting, so forth. Those could be pre-stroke, pre-heart attacks. So then we have our ability to dispatch an ambulance. But under Medicare rules for the senior population, we also have the ability to dispatch an independent EMT or medical transport or medically licensed person like a CNA to that person's home to do some basic vitals checkup and, you know, we know the person is not life-threatening. Okay, stay with us. This has been going on for a while. Yeah, it's kind of been happening every couple of days after I come down the stairs or going up the stairs or whatever happens in the person's life, right? And, and, and that's just normalcy, right? Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, so you're not life-threatening. So we need to not make you stressed out by having you come to the office. Why don't we send someone to you? And let's get pre-approval on sending that person to you. And if by chance that doesn't work, then have a family member bring you in and we'll have a more thorough checkup. But we have tools that in the remote patient monitoring and in the chronic care realm, that once someone is registered in that system, we have tools that can monitor your heart rate, monitor your breathing. We have tools that can monitor your sleep. We have tools that can monitor your physical motion in a building if you're a senior by yourself that also checks your slip, trip, and falls, that if you fall and you're unconscious, you can't reach that what we call the PERS device, your personal emergency response services. I've fallen and I can't get up. We have tools in Wi-Fi that tell us before you even knew you fell, that you fell. Like an example, the, op, the new Apple watch and the new Samsung watch, they both have fall detection in them. The problem with their current fall detection model is that they only dial the public 911 service. Once we submit our documentation that we're uh, your caregiver and you give permission, now that 911 call, if you've fallen and it alerts the fall detection, then immediately calls us. And now you have a care delivery team. The difference between us and the public 911 service is you might have caregivers. You might have a son or a daughter. You might have a true caregiver, medical caregiver in your realm. We can alert all of them immediately that a fall has happened where the public 911 service is completely blind of who you are. You is were, that maybe, helpful? Yeah, you'll, you'll pull up their uh, patient records right away, right? I mean, if, um, if they are, if you're working with a doctor's office. If, if they're... If their number's in our system and they're calling through that number, it will be pulled up when they call it. Got it. Okay. Linda, let's take your question. You can unmute. Good morning, Linda. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, very good point. Uh, just to let you know, I spend endless hours in the conferences regarding digital medicine because mm -hmm. you are related to that, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to accept that humans are analog and not digital, okay? Yeah, it's true, it's true. And I have spent endless hours in uh, panels regarding EMF, 5G, mm -hmm. 6G, mm -hmm. and all those things which yeah. will make our life terrible. And uh, to tell you the day when I will have to go in place and uh, make a handshake with a robot, I prefer to cut my hand or to die because I cannot accept the lack of humanity, of human relationship. And because I am of Greek origin, that is Greek and French. Ah, Ticanis. Ticano. <laughs> uh, very bad. <laughs> Polikaka. So, because uh, ancient Greek uh, Hippocrates and Galinos and all those things uh, were very attached to human contact. Human contact is energy. Mm -hmm. Linda, I'm sorry. So, Linda, so do you have a question? Yes, my question. My question is, 
how close are you related because you will have uh, some uh, devices to alert uh, to digital medicine. You are the number one in digital medicine field, yes or not? That's my question. Well, we, we use digital. We use digital technology as an avenue of data collection. We don't use digital technology as a way of leaving you in relationship to the digital devices as your medical support team. We're human centric. We're a human driven platform. The digital sciences allow us to reach you at a level you couldn't reach yourself. So for example, there's a ring that just came out like a physical ring, like a wedding ring. And inside that ring is the technology to watch your beats per minute, your, your temperature and your blood pressure. Um, and so that's a very important ring um, piece because some people we don't get as good of connection on their wrist, but the ring is true, proven to be really, really accurate. There's no intra, uh, in, in uh, what's the right word? There's no uh, impedance in your daily life. There's no stopping or hurting your daily life. As long as that ring is within a range, a range of Bluetooth to your, to your digital phone. And so that's one piece of technology that's less intrusive. That's the word I was looking for uh, mm -hmm. on your life. And it helps us know that your beats per minute are good because we can set what's called threshold. And then in the digital world of us gathering data, we can set those thresholds. So let's say that your normal wake up every day is at 63, but you woke up yesterday or today at 56, all of a sudden the alarm's gonna go off in our system that you woke up at 56. Well, why did you wake up at 56 beats per minute and not 63? That's not the data controlling your life. That's the data giving your care delivery team, your medical team, data that helps us care for you better. That's when you're gonna get a call from our medical team saying, well, how are you? What's going on? We noticed a little bit of differences in your numbers and maybe you have a care, care delivery person in your realm or a family member in your realm, or maybe you're just on your own and you're, you're medically trained because it seems like you're a very savvy person, Linda. So the key here is not to become robotic. The key is not to become where the data tells us the truth all the time. The key is to connect with the person. Maybe the person's granddaughter put the, put the ring on for an hour or two. We don't always know these things. So we're human centric focused business. We have a 24 hour human driven triage team that's there to serve. Then we have the chronic care management and remote patient monitoring delivery team that once someone's in that program, they have the free rights to call the 24 hour line um, of their doctor's office. And at the same time, we have the ability to reach out to that person and their caregivers. Is that a helpful answer, Linda? Uh, yes and no, because for three days, for three days, I was without internet and without phone because I shifted from Verizon to Xfinity and they gave me a wrong modem and possible to connect. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was not aware what to do in between. Yeah. No call, yeah. no internet. So, so I had to move to another place to, to receive my emails and etc. So those technologies are not uh, like a physical human presence. And uh, if I wake in the morning with a pulse of uh, 36, that could be another issue that uh, you cannot know, like a crisis of my son or another mm -hmm. issue like a floating, which I used to right. have a few days ago. Yeah. Do you understand? But you're bringing up some good points there, Linda, and here's the good points are. <clears throat> we might not know that your internet and your telephone system was down for three days. If you were in our care delivery model under chronic care management and patient monitoring, it's not on right now, but I have this these tablets. And these tablets are of, of 4G and 5G LTE tablets that bring into your home. They sit in your home and they connect to the wireless devices, not your home internet. Your home internet could be a backup to that device. So if by chance our internet relationship with, let's say that you have a good signal strength with Verizon in your area, so we give you a Verizon tablet. And in some areas it's, a, it's an AT&T tablet. And so in our model, we place that tablet in your home. That tablet has a screen. All you do is hit the hot button on that screen. It literally says care delivery. Boom. You're immediately live on audio to our care delivery team. You don't even have to look up a phone number or call the doctor's office. So once you're in the chronic care model, 
there's a whole other suite of services that have primary and secondary service sets. So that's that's a question. Now, the other thing you said was that, you know, how will we know if you drop to 36? Well, guess what? If you're in our care delivery, that's a threshold. And if by chance the technology still is wrapped, we are 10 years, 20 years ahead than where we were just two years ago, because at least we have some type of technology to gather data. Two years ago, none of this stuff was pushing as hard as it is now. And if we can break into that 90% barrier, we can make life a lot easier for all different age brackets and all different health concerns. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Nicholas. We have a question. Last from, question. No, what uh, about Linda? your 5G, 6G tablet? What's the amount of the microwave type radiation that they meet in our home? Very little. Did you ever measure it's, that? It's a, yeah, it's a 4G. It's a 4G tablet right now. I'm not purposely needing to go to 5G. I don't have to go to 5G. They closed down 3G. So I don't have to go to 5G. So you don't have to worry about the heavier microwave. The difference between 4G and 5G is the three, four, 5G has a, has a local band. That's a very strong band to yeah. get into buildings and stuff. 4G already has the external two bands. And we'll, we'll, we have measurement tools to know where people's strengths are. Our, goal, our data, the data that we're taking is very little in terms of data flow. It's nothing like a video or an audio channel. It's less than that. Let's get back to the moder moderator here and go ahead for the next question, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jeff, you're on. Okay, very good. That was excellent, Nicholas. What a great thing that you're doing. My Appreciate question, that, Jeffrey. Sure. My question would be- where Bring, bring me the gold, buddy. Come on now. I was going to say, what's your level of penetration with doctor's offices nationally at this point? And how do you acquire them? How do you contact them to bring them on board? That's a great, that's a great question. So here's the transparency of where we're at. In 2020, January 2020, uh, and I have a group of doctors that, that happen to be from the Chinese culture that are American doctors that speak Chinese. And they started sending me stuff in November of 2019. And they started sending me some really bizarre videos before all the cancel culture stuff was happening. I was seeing people being welded shut doors in their homes in China. And I've been to China. I lived in China for months. So I knew what kind of homes those were. I knew what was going on. I was like, this is really crazy, Dr. Chung. What's going on here? And he'd explain to me in his broken English, but uh, they would basically say it's coming. It's coming to the States. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, well, let's see what happens when it comes. And we should be ready for it. And no, no, well, of course, we weren't ready for it. So I, I was in the position where I had over 100 doctor's offices to launch in January, 2020. And I had to watch all, I had to humble myself and watch all that go wayside because it would have killed our business if we took in all of those mundane calls, if we got off the ground. And to get a hundred doctors wasn't too difficult. Um, the principle here is the presentation, the teaching, the, the moment. So right now we're focused on launching the state of Florida here in 2022, two years later. Uh, my CFO, if you go to our webpage, is, was a Florida Blues guy for 18 years. And we have a really high level clinical person that's not on our website. Um, her name is Amy. And then we have uh, Jerry, who's out of Nashville. And she's in charge of our clinical operations. So we have the uh, 6,500 or so prime family practice, um, general practitioner, and uh, my brain's frying here, guys. Sorry about that. So anyway, the uh, the traditional um, the traditional family office, right? So there's six thousand five hundred primary care, family practice, and general practitioner offices in the state of Florida. Six thousand five hundred. We honestly need one percent, sixty to sixty-five, to affect one hundred eighty thousand people. About three thousand patients per doctor's office. Out of those 3,000 patients per doctor's office, we've written our spreadsheets based on a 3% penetration in the first year, second year, sixth, the third year, nine. And we're, it's, the numbers are a hockey stick. It's ridiculous. We're, it's, it's, it's so crazy. And by the way, I did get to do this before with a couple of doctor's offices. We did not have the ambulance delivery. We did not have those uh, other service sets. And we certainly didn't have the advancement in remote patient monitoring that we have today. But the numerous cash flow avenues that come out of hooking up to a doctor's office allow us to go to a doctor and say, we're going to write you a check. And that check's going to make you, you and your staff more comfortable. Because we don't want to affect the nine to five office. We're not here to change the nine to five office. We're here to expand their license, which is a legal license open 24 seven. 
We're here to expand their license by law in each state. So a doctor in Jacksonville could serve a patient in Miami. A patient in, in Fresno, California could be served by a doctor from San Diego. So um, we're here to expand the license 720 hours a month. And we're here to expand the license in distance of the state that the doctor's license in. Is that a helpful response, Mr. Gold? That was Mr. Cantor, but that's correct. It was good. Oh, I apologize. No problem. Uh, no problem. I see Jeffrey Gold on the We're list. Taking, the that's Jeffs that. are taking over the world, just so you know, Nicholas. So <laughs> don't worry about it. It's just as one of my partners. <laughs> no, okay, that was good. very good. But what, how do you approach the doctors? I mean, they, when you, you know, you got what you've got, how do you reach out or find the other doctors you want to start to try to talk to? Well, what we started to do in 2019 when I acquired my 911 is I started to build a, uh, a non-sales team, a team that wasn't there to go sell the doctor a team that was to go there and educate the doctors of the service. So that's what we're going to start. We're going to start up a new team. I'll be the lead when it's time to do a presentation. We tried to do some video in 2019. The brand, My911, is a really powerful brand. People get it. They understand it. Uh, doctors get it. Um, and they want it. They want it. They're intrigued by it. What is it? And my first joking response to the doctors is, is I want to write you a check. That's what it is. And they go, okay, what? How are you going to do that? And I said, well, when I convert your practice to its own 24-hour model, these are the outcomes. This is what happens. I benefit you. You benefit me. Here's how we both win. So it's a matter of getting out of 6,500 doctor's offices in the state of Florida, 65 of them to sign up and contract. That's 1% penetration. I know of insurance companies that would, that would absolutely kill the broker, send him on his way, if he didn't get, you know, more than 1% out of 6,500 in the first 90 days, right? Uh, so in, in terms of closing policies or closing deals. So it, it's a little bit different sales model in working with the doctor's offices because they are giving us permission to work with their license. Is that helpful? No, that was very good. Appreciate that. Hey, um, Nicholas, uh, kind of following on that, how do you, maybe triage is the word, but you pick up one of the patients, somebody's having an issue, right? You get the call, you're doing after hours with somebody. Um, how does that translate into the next day or the next week where you've got the doctor's team that's been working with a patient, but now you're kind of involved or your people, your doctors, uh, you know, where is there a handoff? Um, no, the medical record platform of whatever doctor choice, whether it's Epic, Cerna, Athena, it doesn't really matter to us because our software is not built on a medical record platform. Our software is built for chronic care management, remote patient monitoring, and telemedicine. So we can, our system, when we take in new notes, so, uh, you know, Jane Doe calls in and uh, is talking to our care delivery team. We found out through the medical record that she had an appointment with the doctor two weeks ago. Did you go to that appointment? What came out of that appointment? There's not many notes from that appointment. Oh, I missed that appointment. Would you like to schedule a new appointment? You know, would you like to talk to us now? So, you know, there's certain levels of, of in, in the databases of the, of the doctor's office, which by the way, we get full access to their database. It's not like we're running blind here. So we, we can leave notes for the team. We can structure that. And that also comes back to our first interviews with the doctor. You know, what do you want? What would you like to see out of this? Do you want your 10 most important customers that when they call in, if they call in because they left your office this week, you're concerned about them. Do you want us to update you by the minute, hour, or by the day? I mean, what do you want? Some doctors are not going to be comfortable with us taking their phones 24 seven. They still want their phones to ring nine to five and that's fine. But then when it, we, we just changed the, the, what to call the IVR tree that calls in and says, Hey, if you want the care, the 24 hour care delivery team, press one. If you want the general office, press two, right? As opposed to if you think you've, if this emergency hang up and down 911. So it's all up to really making the doctor comfortable. Is that helpful? Yeah. Um, moving on to the bid, back to the business for a minute. Uh, we had started to talk about capital, capital raising, um, what you see your needs are. Maybe you could uh, address that uh, towards your expansion in the next couple of years. What kind of a, what are you looking at? Well, depending on the relationship with the investor um, that we're looking for, we have a, a figure. I don't want to publicly talk about the dollar figures specifically, but I will say this. 
we have cut back all of our CPT code earnings significantly. So instead of making $120 on a CPT code, we're making $60 in, the, in our spreadsheets. And in cutting things back, including annual wellness visit, other things, only focusing on the senior market. And the reason why I'm, I'm speaking about that, and here's a little educational point, why I'm only speaking about the senior market. The senior market is a single payer ready to go market. So when I do this model with the doctor's office, it is 30 to 60 days to cash flow. We're ready to go. When I connect with that doctor's office, the moment we start taking on the senior market is the moment our care team, our medical team, meets up with the doctor's team to find out all the different insurances that are already being used or not in the, in the case of a DPC doctor, uh, in the case of that. And then those, let's say there's 10 different PPOs that they have a contracts with. Well, we need to recontract with those doctors, those, those, those insurance carriers for 24 hour care. If I took you in as a 24 hour uh, customer, 11 o'clock at night on a Friday, and we took your call and, and we're not in that insurance carrier's ecosystem, the insurance <laughs> carriers are like, hey, thank, thank you. Thanks for taking care of my customer, my patient. So, you know, then, so stage one is the senior market. Stage two is the general population. Stage three is finding out what else is in the marketplace that might help that doctor's office. Um, so in that process, we've basically, my CFO is like, if we push this out any longer than three years, it's a stupid hockey stick. The revenue streams are ridiculous. We only really use four or five revenue streams. And, and we're using two categories for those revenue streams, three, I should say, after our brick and mortar calls, chronic care management, and remote patient monitoring. We're not even getting into pharmacy and labs. Mm -hmm. So by working with the doctor's office, we unlock our ability to charge numerous CPT codes, numerous legs of the event. It's tens of millions of dollars in revenue in. And honestly, it's a small smidgen that we need up front to launch our first 60 doctor's offices in Florida. It's not huge compared to the, the return on investment. We can return someone's investment rather quickly and we can keep them in the pipeline for a very satisfied investor. Is that helpful? Yeah. So are you uh, currently raising capital or? Yes, that's oh, our okay. stage right now. We're currently needing to raise the capital. All of our teams are right. ready to go. All of our technology is ready to go. We're ready to start marketing to doctor's offices. Uh, one thing I will say is that in the unlocking process of working with the senior market is when we get to the medical therapy management space, we then get the ability to reformulate their 12 different drugs given to them by five different doctors because our pharmacist will send a letter off to the doctors who wrote the original prescription and say, uh, we think we found a reason why this person's bladder is acting up every night at 3 a.m. Or we think we found the reason why they're dizzy after taking your pill, can we change the formularies to this? Can we do that? And in that process, we 911 get to be part of the distribution channel and use data technology that helps that consumer. So there's a pill pack type models out there where you pull your pill out of a take one type device and that has a barcode on it. And it tells us that you're on track you're supposed to be at pill 32 today and you're at pill 30, pill pack 32 and you're at pill pack 32. And that data is in our system. And all of a sudden you miss three or four packs. That data is now an alert for us to contact you or the caregiver. Is that helpful? Yeah. So right now um, I'm not, well, for a typical doctor's office or the people you're working with, um, they don't track all of like the different formularies or pills or prescriptions that seniors especially are on or is anybody over really over 95 percent of all medication is recorded right i mean you bring all your pills and all your vitamins into your doctor's office and they'll take pictures of it and they'll put it in their electronic health record system and they'll know that dr Singh down the street is working with you in your kidneys right. uh, situation or you've got a cancer care doctor and they're working with you but as the as the as the primary care physician, they're required to keep records of those things, but they're not required to engage in that problem. Got it. So that looks like there's also, helpful? yeah, and they should be probably, right? Well, 
Somebody they don't should have be the looking staff. at that. Well, the they, pharmacy, they, right. The pharmacist, you're right, should be looking at that. They don't have the staff for the program. The guy yeah. they created for CVS, he's in here. He's here in, if you look up Fresno, California, you'll find that we're a tier one city medically for LA and San Francisco, if in fact there's a catastrophe. So even during COVID, it got snuck out to the media that we had whole floors of empty beds here in town. Well, that's because if, a, if an accident happens, or a major catastrophe happened in San Francisco or LA, those whole floors are waiting for air vac to come out of LA or San Francisco. They're not, those, those floors are not for general purpose. They are for emergencies for LA or San Francisco. So we have a tremendous amount of great medical people here in this town that I live in. And um, one of the things is I recently went to CVS for my mother-in-law and I said, how, I haven't seen you before. How long have you been here? He said, well, I just came on board to launch uh, Walgreens, was Walgreens, to launch Walgreens medical therapy management program. And I said, oh, do tell. We got to do a conversation for 15 minutes. And he goes, yeah, but after being here for six months, they, they, they haven't done anything with it. It doesn't look like they're going to do anything with it. So I'm looking for a job. I mean, I mean it's like, here's this huge distributor of, of, of drugs, you know, Walgreens, and they're still not, you know, getting there. And it, mm -hmm. it just, it's all mind boggling of, of the math. So, next it. question. Anyone else out there? So how did we, uh, until I, we see something, how did we find you? How did uh, Charles find you? Was it LinkedIn before you got? Uh... I've got over 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. And I think Charles uh, and somebody else I know in Charles's realm introduced me to Charles. And this was at least three, four years ago or more. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I went to a, a conference in San, a Stanford University it was a healthcare conference and a little bit on the, turned out to be a little bit political, but uh, I learned a lot at that healthcare conference. And I think that was about 2016. I think that's about the time someone there said, you need to meet this guy. He's doing some things in, in DC. Nicholas, uh, I was going to ask you, are you involved in any way with the medical cannabis world, the emerging? Not, not specifically. I mean, it, it has a lot of values in terms of some of their, uh, formularies. I know that there is uh, non-THC, different levels. There's like, you know, there's A and there's B and there's C and, there, and there's different oils and stuff. And I do know that there's some advantages to those. I've seen some reports and, uh, you know, I can't, it's not, the, it's not the niche that I've seen my 911 working in. Now, for a DPC doctor or for a standalone insurance carrier in a self-funded realm, my 911 has value because it's one phone number for all medical events. Wouldn't matter if it's workers' comp, wouldn't matter if it's healthcare related, if it's a slip, trip, and fall, or if it's um, uh, transportation or mental health. We can answer all those calls and we can serve that person. Excellent. Is your, um, your other entrepreneurial uh, work, what you've done? Is that in the medical field or something else? Or, or don't you want to share that? You're muted. You're muted. I don't know why. Sorry, I've been in medical since 2012. And I started working with the ER doc. So I've kind of stayed focused on here. However, I still keep my consulting hat on in helping other entrepreneurs. And I have sat on numerous boards and, and other teams and stuff. Even to have a telecommunications background like I have in dealing with fiber optics since 1995, uh, and doing with paging mobile phone before that, uh, you know, that's that's not something you find every day. So I get people who call me up and ask questions all the time about different things. But I've also done audits in the electrical industry. I, somewhere in my archives, I have the uh, physical electrical bill from Luxor Hotel, uh, where they wanted me to audit the bill and not audit to save money, but audit in terms of usage, electricity right. usage. And and, and to evaluate their inductive motors uh, and stuff because I have a background in that electrical space. Huh. So when Linda asked about the energy levels of the tablet, it's so, it's so nominal that I, I, I've never even needed to research it because data from remote patient monitoring devices is so low, very, very low. Yeah, yeah. Linda, you have a, a Yeah, a I question? have a question, Nicholas, about the medication that you said that you can't find what medication. In my case, my primary care physician for a pain that I had in the back prescribed uh, to me trazodone, 50 milligrams per day. I never took a pill 
she continues to prescribe. So I have four tubes, like 120 pills. I never took one. Just the pain was relieved with some hot pads under my back. So if you look at my register for medication, you will see that I have shallow right now uh, 120 pills of trazodone with all the side effects that means. Uh, so how we can, how you can um, uh, deal with those type of problems? Well, let, let's, 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 let's take a little step closer to home. Let's assume for a second, Linda, that you are my mother or that you're my mother-in-law and I'm taking care of you, which I happen to have taken care of my own mother and my mother-in-law. So it fits just fine. Uh, and uh, in the case of your situation, the caregivers sometimes go to the doctor's offices with you. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes in a case of my 911, we can put a message into the doctor's office that Linda's bringing in her 120 pills because she's never taken a single one. And, and, and you, and because the doctor, honestly, the systems sometimes are not aware it's, it's, um, it's empathetic listening, but it's also empathetic training and teaching backwards. It's also saying, Hey, are you guys aware that Linda hasn't been taking her drugs at all? She never took a single one and she's worried about what she should do with the 120 pills sitting around her house of, a, of this very strong drug. And, and they have procedures of disposing those drugs and you should bring them back in and make them aware of that. I mean, it's, it's a simple um, tentative opening of communications, right? Tentative opening. Uh, hey, doctor's office, are you aware that I have never taken a single one of these, but you keep re-prescribing these? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a checkbox in the database. Just, just turn off the checkbox. And, and so you all know where I started in the computer computers in 1990, and I built my own databases. So uh, that's basically everything I've done is spurred because I understand databases. And Linda's situation is purely a database uh, situation. It's not the doctor. You, you don't assume that the doctor wants to subscribe you something that you're not taking. That's not part of the doctor's ecosystem. They don't, they shouldn't be doing that, but you need to make them, you need to be a good consumer and use tentative opening and say, I'm not sure you're aware that the doctor keeps re-prescribing this to me. And my pharmacy keeps telling me that more is available and I've never taken a single one. Yeah. Uh, we're running, uh, coming up on the hour here, Nicholas. All right. Thank you. It's a uh, wonderful <laughs> Really good to see what you're doing there. It's a great idea. Great concept. Uh, great Thank you. company. So how can people get in touch with you if they would like to? Uh, if they know how to spell Nicholas, N-I-C-H-O-L-E-S, mm -hmm. at my911.com. If they see the Zoom, they'll see it right up here on the Zoom. It's by, there's my email uh, because I'm using an older Mac that doesn't have a camera on it. So, but I do want to see everybody. So that's the screen I'm looking at. I'm looking at that screen. I'm not looking away. So, uh, so yeah, that's um, Nicholas at My911. They can email me. They can go to the website and fill out the form under My911. Uh, okay. Easy. I'm easy. So what about your wealth? If your money could actually talk to you, would you listen to it? Well, with the DNA Network Academy, your money actually can talk to you. And it's going to tell you just what it told this client. This family had over 24 debts, mortgages, car loans, the works. They were on track to take 20 years to pay it all off and instead did it in 8.5. Plus, they did it without refinancing, making more money, or even changing their lifestyle. So find out for yourself with a free analysis that is completely confidential. No personal information no social security numbers, no credit checks, none of that nonsense. But what is exciting is that the outcome of that report you receive is a guaranteed outcome for you. To get that report, head on over to bit.ly forward slash debt to wealth. You will arrive at this simple form. Fill it in as simple as lender number one and credit card number two. What really matters is the accuracy of your numbers you'll be able to see that if instead of 20 years or whatever your number is, that you may actually be out of debt and on your way to wealth in as little as 6.3 years like this client. 